This week on Obsessed with Wine. So as a manager of people, I need to make sure my people are taken care of to the utmost. A couple weeks go by, I get a phone call. He says, go to this address, drive up to the house. I'll meet you there. Uh, so I, I drove, went up to the house, knocked on the door, and Carl Damani answers and says, come on in. A couple minutes later, Aaron shows up, and the three of us just start having a conversation. Fifteen minutes in, Carl says, uh, your title is going to be associate winemaker. This is a salary. You get X number of vacation. And I just kind of sat there dumbfounded. Like, this, this was an interview or, you know, you're just giving me a job? Hello, wine enthusiasts. My name is Wesley Cable. I want to welcome you to another brand new episode of the Obsessed with Wine podcast. Since harvest season is upon us, this episode will complete the first season of the Obsessed with Wine podcast. Napa Valley is renowned for its world-class wines, and Quixote Winery is one of the valley's most acclaimed producers. Located in the Stag's Leap District, Quixote specializes in small lot wine, including a Petite Syrah, their flagship wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, and a highly sought-after Malbec. I had the opportunity to sit down with Robert Smith, Quixote's winemaker, to discuss the winery's history and philosophy. He has a wealth of knowledge about all things related to viticulture and winemaking, and it was a pleasure to pick his brain about the subject. So grab your glass of your favorite wine. It's time for Obsessed with Wine. All right, so tonight's guest for the podcast is Robert Smith, the great winemaker over at Quixote Winery in Napa, California. Robert, thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you, Wesley, for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. It's it's been it's awesome. I can't wait to talk to you. So, I usually like to start out with talking to people about how they got their love for wine and where that came from. So, for you, Robert, how did that all happen? I uh, started working at uh, a small family-owned winery you might have heard of called E&J Gallo. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I've heard of that small winery, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're they're pretty small. I'm from Modesto, California, so their headquarters is there. One of my high school teachers got me a job working in their research lab at Gallo, just doing odds and ends, uh, cleaning up labware, things like that, a couple hours a week. It was a fun little job uh, right out of high school. Uh, And eventually, they started showing me how to actually run some of the lab equipment, like uh, the DNA sequencers and the PCR machines and fun stuff like that. Still way over my head at like 18, 19 years old, not, not understanding the concepts behind all this stuff. But while I was there, I took an interest in fermentation more specifically brewing beer because I was underage and I could buy all the ingredients myself. I would bring some of my beers for my coworkers to try and they thought they were pretty good. And I was actually entertaining a career in uh, brewing, uh, but they talked me out of it. They're like, eh, you might want to look into the wine industry. It's like you work at a winery right now think about it you know it's uh, more of a seasonal thing this was like 2000 2001 so it was i think before the the big craft brew uh revolution back then it was just just wasn't there yet so uh, they were they were definitely pushing the uh food and wine lifestyle and then they also said i might get paid more and that that's what resonated with me was uh oh, okay uh, maybe I'll get paid more becoming a winemaker. So I wound up uh, going to Fresno State University to get a degree in enology. And while I was there, I was working at a wine shop uh, in Fresno and also joined a student-run organization, the uh, Enology Society, uh, where I got to taste a lot of wines on a weekly basis. So it was um, through those, those two things that uh, I really started to develop more of a passion uh, for wine, especially as I was exposed to it more and more because nobody in my family drank wine. Uh, I'm the first generation to go into winemaking and who knows, maybe the last generation of my family to go into winemaking. We'll see. So, so for me, it was, uh, it was definitely something that I had to foster myself. 
So before this experience working at the winery, you weren't a wine drinker at all. Nobody was a wine drinker at all. So mom didn't drink at all. Uh, dad, I'd see him have the occasional Bud Light or Coors. May, like if we were out at dinner, he'd, he'd order a Tom Collins, and that was that was about it. You know, never there was never any wine in the house. So you you said you grew up in Modesto. I did. I okay, did. and so when you were figuring out where to go. I guess Fresno, is is that where you wanted to go, Fresno State, for college? Or is that just because it was closer to where you were li- where you were living? Or how, how did you decide on Fresno? At that time, the choices were on the West Coast, UC Davis, Oregon State, and Fresno State. I applied to all three, got into Fre- uh, Oregon State. UC Davis said no. I, I didn't have the GPA to get into UC Davis. So uh, it's all good. And then I never heard anything from Fresno. Uh, funny enough, you know, my parents and I, we drove down to Fresno to do just like a campus tour, check it out. Uh, and so we stopped by the admissions office and told them, say, hey, I applied a month and a half, two months ago. I haven't heard anything. What's going on? So uh, they typed in my info and looked at me and said, oh, well, welcome to Fresno State. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then you know, walking around the enology program and uh, or the building over there, and uh, talking with some of the professors and a few students that were around, uh, it just felt like uh, Fresno was the the right choice. Plus, it was only an hour and a half away from Modesto, so Fresno's di- Fresno State. So they have a just an enology program. It's not a it's not like a Davis program where there's viticulture and enology, or is it both? There's both. Uh, there's a, a huge viticulture program. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it all started around viticulture, uh, not just wine grapes, but also table and, and raisin grape uh, production. And then the winemaking came into play shortly thereafter. So once you're done with this degree at Fresno, did you have goals of all right, I, I want to go to Napa Valley and make wine, or, or what was the thought at that time? Well, uh, I actually took a semester off uh, in fall 2006 to work harvest, um, and a friend of mine, uh, Jose Calderon, uh, got me linked up with Aaron Pott, uh, who was winemaker at Quintessa at the time. So I went up, worked harvest 06 to see if uh, I needed to change majors afterwards, I I absolutely loved it. Uh, you know, it was just fast paced, somewhat chaotic, on my feet all day, doing pump overs, moving barrels, first harvest ever. And by the end of it, I, I was sold that this was the career path for me. So, and after that, you know, I just kind of uh, made it a, a long term goal to hopefully become a winemaker in, in Napa Valley. So I didn't think it would happen as fast as it did. So what, what other wineries did you work at and like how did everything end up where you're currently at at Quixote? Towards the end of that harvest, Aaron had pulled me aside and let me know that uh, he'd, he'd noticed how hard I'd been working uh, throughout harvest. Uh, I mean, by the end of harvest, I had dropped almost 50 pounds. Yeah, well, I was, I was pushing 300 when I started. So Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> A lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, so he... he um, wanted to let me know that he wanted me to keep in contact with him, just kind of keep him posted on how my studies were going. And, you know, if um, I wanted to do any other internships uh, in the future, or if there was anything he could help me out with uh, later down the road. So uh, I went back, finished up my schooling in like fall 08, and then took off to work harvest in South Africa. And then when I came back, I reached out to Aaron, and uh, at that point, he had started consulting and was no longer a winemaker at at Quintessa. One of his clients, uh, Seven Stones, uh, he was looking for um, a harvest intern, so he hooked me up with uh, an internship there in 2009. And then we linked up again in 2011 uh, when he was consulting for Krupp Brothers. And so I worked Harvest um, there, became good friends with, with the winemaker at the time, Tress Getting. And in fact, actually, it was like middle of Harvest. We were wandering one of the cab blocks up at Stagecoach. Uh, and Aaron just kind of stops, turns around, says, I might have a job for you after Harvest. I'll call you in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks go by, I get a phone call. He says, go to this address, drive up to the house. I'll meet you there. 
Uh, so I, I drove here, uh, went up to the house, uh, knocked on the door and Carl Damani answers and says, come on in. A couple minutes later, Aaron shows up and the three of us just started having a conversation and, you know, 15 minutes in, Carl says, uh, your title is going to be associate winemaker. This is a salary. You get X number of vacation. And I just kind of sat there dumbfounded. Like this, this was an interview or, you know, you're just giving me a job. Wow. Obviously said yes. So, you know, I, I definitely skipped a few steps, went from harvest intern to associate winemaker at 29 years old. So it was definitely a steep learning curve. I think it was just, you know, I was so nerve wracked the first six months, just like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so did you feel at that time you were ready? It was, or was that like you were, didn't feel like you were, but it was something that you would grow into? Yeah, uh, I I, uh, I was not ready, uh, but you know Aaron had a lot of confidence in me, um, and also he was making his wine here at the time, so he was here on an almost daily basis. So it, it was like I had a built-in safety net in a lot of ways. So uh, for me, it was like somebody's going to give me that kind of an opportunity. I'm just going to say yes and figure the shit out as I as I go. What an awesome opportunity! Jeez, that's so cool. I'm I'm happy for you. That's really cool. So obviously you earned it though. I mean, like you said, you worked all those harvests and and lost all that weight and, you know, worked hard and and it paid off for you. That's good. Yeah, thank you. So now you're at Quixote Winery, if I'm saying that right. It's located off the Silverado Trail and I've been down the Silverado Trail numerous times, but I, I I can't remember seeing it. So where is it in compared to other places on the Silverado Trail? So we're, we're tucked like three quarters of a mile back uh, off the trail. So if you're heading north on the Silverado Trail, heading towards the Yonville Crossroad, you'll hang a right just past Silverado Vineyards and basically follow the driveway all the way back. So we share a driveway with Schaefer and Stagsley Point. So we're actually sandwiched right in between the two. Quixote Winery is located in the Stag's Leap District. Are all the grapes from the Stag's Leap District that you guys use? Yeah. So we're doing uh, 100% estate wines. Uh, it's all organically farmed. We've got 27 acres of vineyard. Um, it's almost split 50-50 between Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Petit Syrah. Uh, and then we've got small plantings of Malbec, uh, Cab Franc, and Petit Verdot. For people, obviously, people have heard of Stag's Leap District. Obviously, it's a very famous place. But, but for those you know who maybe don't know all the details, what are wines that are made in from the uh, grapes in that district? What characteristics are, do they have, and that kind of stuff? I I feel like uh, you know the cabs, um, you know they they have a lot of power and finesse uh, to the tannin structure. Uh, a lot of people call it, you know, the iron fist in the uh, velvet glove. For me, like the wines always have this kind of distinctive uh, cherry aromatic component to them um, and very silky tannins uh, as well. And, you know, a, a fair amount of acid uh, in the wines, which I think just really helps retain freshness and drive aging potential. Now, for people who haven't been to the winery, you guys are a smaller winer in the sense of production. It, according to the website, you make about 2,000 cases annually. So I want to ask you, why are wineries so close to the vest when it comes to how much they produce? Because usually people don't give that information out, and they're weird about it when you ask. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I, I have an idea of what you're talking I don't get it. You know, you produce what you produce. Tell people, why, why does it matter? I think there's a lot of proprietary secrets that who cares? <laughs> <laughs> nothing there's nothing to it other than that i guess i was thinking the same thing like who cares but so i don't know much about the history of the winery so could you just give me a quick history like how it all got started i i really don't know that much about that winery yeah uh so quixote was the brainchild of carl damani the property that Quixote sits on was actually part of the his original purchase of the Stag's Leap property, uh, Stag's Leap Winery property, 
in the late 60s. It was like a 400-acre parcel that uh, he wound up splitting into three parcels. Sometime in the 80s, I think he had this idea of creating a winery built around Petit Syrah because it was his favorite varietal. Felt like it just never got the respect that it deserved. And he thought he could change the world's perception of it. You know, and that's kind of where the name Quixote comes into play. Uh, you know, Carl going on this uh, whimsical quest to change the world's perception of Petit Syrah, kind of like Don Quixote going off on one of his adventures. He was in an architect's office trying to figure out, you know, what kind of a design he wanted. And, you know, I think he went to office after office, met with multiple architects, just didn't find anything that uh, uh, really got his creative juices going. And then um, he saw a Friedenreich Hundertwasser calendar on one of the architect's desks and asked, who's that? Uh, that's what I want right there. Friedenreich Hundertwasser, he's uh, an artist uh, from Vienna. I feel like he was heavily influenced by Gaudi. Uh, a lot of his buildings are super playful, have bright tiles, golden domes, living roofs, but in some ways, you know, have a lot of earth tones and, and are meant to partly blend in with nature. Carl had spent I think, almost two years trying to get in touch with Friedenreich Hundertwasser. So finally in 88 or 89, he got him to come do a site visit and they were wandering uh, the property, Carl, Friedenreich and his entourage. Uh, and at one point Friedenreich just kind of goes missing uh, as they were walking along the irrigation pond and Everyone's looking for him, and they find a pile of his clothes uh, next to the bank. He decided to just kind of strip down and go for a swim. Later, he pops up out of the water, and it's like, yeah, I love this place. Uh, I will I'll design your winery for you. So the design process actually took, I want to say, upwards of seven years. A lot of back and forth, you know, between him and Carl via fax, phone calls, you know, no emails at this point. So it just it just took forever. They broke ground in ninety six or ninety seven, uh, and it took about three years to complete parts of the building, like um, facade for the barrel room. That every time Friedenreich came for a site visit, he'd see it, and something wasn't up to his specs, and so. He had it torn down and rebuilt three times. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> I mean, with him, it was nothing in, in in nature is perfect, so none of his buildings will be perfect. Uh, there are no straight lines. Um, there's tile that is not set uh, perfectly straight. And in fact, he made use of a lot of broken pieces and would actually deliberately break pieces to to set. Uh, as tile. So I, it's, it's just one of those places like you look at the website, look at the pictures, and they just don't do it justice. Like uh, you really do need to come here to really understand it. Yeah, I've seen the the website is, I mean, the pictures are pretty amazing on the online. So if it's even better in person, I, I can't imagine it's probably pretty awesome then to see. And the bottles kind of kind of fit the whole mold of, of all that too, right? They're creative and bright and, and everything like you're talking about. Yeah, so the labels, you know, once the winery was finished, uh, Carl told Friedenreich that uh, he needed a label to fit the building. So uh, I was on a flight back to Vienna that uh, he, he drew um, the label. And there are elements uh, to the label that are shared with the building, uh, like some of the blue tiles, the earth tones, and then the, all the foil work really kind of play into the um, uh, bright metallic uh, tiles that are, are dotted around the, the building. Pretty cool place. I bet it's a great place to work. You get to go there every day, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a bad place to come every day. I, I remind myself of how fortunate I am to, to call this work. I mean, a lot of days it doesn't feel like work. Uh, it's just, it just feels like my second home. It will feel like work pretty soon, though, right? In the next month or so, when you guys get started? Yeah, I can't wait to get started. I, I kind of thrive on the chaos. When it gets a little slow, I start going stir crazy. So with Harvest coming up, uh, I know it's July, end of July. So when do you guys really get rolling on Harvest? For us, like I we make a little bit of rosé from Petit Syrah. So that'll be a small pick, third week of August, fourth week of August, because uh, I'll do a whole cluster press. 
uh, on that. And then it just gets real slow for a couple more weeks. And then about mid September, uh, we'll, we'll start slow rolling some of the petite Syrah. And then by the end of the month, we're right into the cab. So does the Malbec come in a different uh, at a different time than the cab? Uh, yeah, Malbec and the Petit Syrah are kind of on the same timeline, mid to late September. Our, our smallest block of Petit Syrah that goes into the reserve, uh, that block and the Malbec block are kind of my barometers for where where the season's going. And how do things look then for this year so far? For us, the crop's pretty light, definitely below average, uh, but you know that's that's a function of rainfall back to back years. So I do feel like the quality is definitely going to be up with the uh, the reduced crop. So that's that's one good thing. Um, but uh, hopefully we can uh, get some rainfall this this winter and spring. And so let's talk about the winemaking because that's my favorite part to talk about. It says on the website, hand-picked fruit and sorted by hand. So everything's done delicately by hand. And the website mentions you guys only put the fruit in the in small picking bins, not half-ton macro bins like everyone else. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, the website is going through an update. Cause we didn't... So that's not current anymore, huh? That's not in current information? No, no, no. Uh, so I, I was able to upgrade uh, some of our crush equipment a few years back. So like I got uh, a newfangled uh, destemmer and was also able to, to lease an optical sorter. So, you know, it's, it's super gentle on, on the fruit, like get a lot of whole berries through. I, I feel like the wine quality has definitely gone up uh, since since making the changes. And, you know, now we're picking in the half ton bins, but, you know, we're on the estate. So it's not like the fruit's going very far. So it's, it's really not getting crushed under its own weight. I mean, there might be a tiny bit of juice at the bottom of the bin, but it's really not a lot. Not like if I was hauling from like the Sonoma Coast here or somewhere further where, you know, you'd run the risk of, of more um, compaction and, and crushing. So, and also like with the newer equipment, you kind of need to run it at a higher uh, throughput for it to work really well. So you, so the optical sorter, so I, those things are awesome. I've, I've seen, you know, I've worked at a winery that had one of those and it's, it's super cool. So just for those who don't know, what is it for and what does it do for your wine? So it basically ramps up the speed at which you can process fruit. Um, the, the machine that we're using has a series of four cameras, uh, and you can set the parameters uh, to kick out raisins, mog material other than grape, and, and to the degree at which, you know, if you want to get very aggressive with it uh, or less aggressive, basically it'll shoot an air blast uh, to knock out anything it identifies in those parameters, you know, leaving you with some seriously clean fruit at you know upwards of three four tons to the hour versus running at half a ton to one ton an hour with 12 people sorting and so that machine really helps just get the best of the best fruit it really does and and the nice thing about speeding up the processing is that uh you know it's not taking us 12 hours to process fruit we can do you know 15 tons in five hours leaving a lot more time to get through the cleanup and and more time to focus on actual winemaking rather than just processing fruit well the worst part about processing fruit is the cleanup actually so uh, cleaning the optical sorters is, is a, a real chore <laughs> actually the this optical sorter takes me about 15 minutes to clean that's it? Yeah. It's small. It's awesome in its simplicity in that. You can get a really good cleaning job done in a short amount of time. Cleanup's always the worst. It was always the worst for us. It was, oh, yeah. You know, sure. you know. Sorting things for 12 hours, and then you've got another two hours of, of cleanup on top of that, and it's like the sixth day in a row. I don't care how much OT or double time you're getting. At some point, you're pissed off and you don't want You are. <laughs> totally, Yeah. Um, so let me see what else, what other information I got from the website that's out of date. So it says here that uh, you guys, the wine, the grapes go through a cold soak. Now, is do you guys still do that? Yeah, yeah. No, and I, tell tell the people who are listening, what is a cold soak and what does it do for the wine? You know, the cold soak, it just really allows for more extraction of color, uh, phenols, anthocyanins from the skins. I mean, all that you'll ultimately extract when you start fermenting and, you know, 
come up to temperature. Also, I use a cold soap to, you know, give me a little bit of cushion if we have too much fruit coming in too fast. The winery is not just a complete chaotic mess. Pump overs and... <laughs> So you guys also do a process where in, on the website it says you take out some of the liquid, rem, remove it from the tank to help the wines become richer and fuller bodied. So I've heard of this process. It's got a name, right? The name of the process? Uh, Senye. So you bleed off some of the juice. And you want to do that early on. Uh, otherwise, you know, you've extracted all this color and flavor and then you're throwing it down the drain. So you definitely want to do it early on. Uh, but what that does is it increases the uh the juice to to skin ratio so you just you know more concentration more body just more of everything now in your upgrade of the cellar and the equipment do you guys still do the hand punch downs and that kind of stuff uh on a couple lots yeah some of the small lots that we'll do uh i'll do i'll kind of alternate you know some punch downs some pump overs some of the better stuff that you know will will ferment in punch ins those get 100% punch downs i'll I'll rent some small uh, porta tanks for harvest at most there's like maybe two and a half tons in one so those i'll punch down all of them once the fermentation gets going and punch downs are no joke either once once you get the cap starting to build up on there those can be kind of kind of rough right yeah especially at the start of fermentation when things haven't really broken down yet i mean you're up there trying to just mash this thing and you're out of breath or at least my fat self is out of breath and Sweating up a storm. Then I look and go, okay, I got four more of these uh, after this. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. That's hard work. I, I've said this before on other episodes, but um, we used to, at one of the wineries, we used to, I had to do a two hour pump over once. And it seemed like it took forever. And it was, n- that part of it wasn't great, but it was the greatest. Uh, experience for your senses though because just the colors and the smells and everything you get from it is pretty awesome yeah you get to i mean you you get all the aromas from the wine from the fermentation uh you got to be careful though because you do get a little bit of the co2 kicking back but you know you get to feel the temperature of the wine you you know when you've hit a cool spot uh, versus a hot spot and so it really helps you kind of try to get a good mix on things experiencing all of those things uh during pump over it's just really kind of helps you focus on so as far as fermentation for these wines uh, how do you guys do that is that in stainless steel tanks or do you guys do barrels what do you guys use for that we I do a combination. Uh, I do I've got three concrete tanks that uh, I'll ferment in. We have mostly stainless steel tanks here. I'll, I'll pop the heads off a few 500 liter punchins and and do uh, uh, fermentations in those as well. So what do the concrete tanks do for you? Like what do they bring to the wine? Our best petite Syrah, it has brought out like some characteristics that I, I had never experienced with Petite Syrah. So just the, the sheer thickness of the uh, walls of the, of the concrete tanks really insulates you know, the fermentation, barely gets above 80 degrees. So the wine's definitely fermenting at a cooler temperature. So with the Petite, like it's brought out these super floral kind of lavender aromatics. The tannins are super soft. It's almost like this... Very elegant uh, and and sexy wine that that ends up coming out of the tank. We do maybe a two to three week extended maceration to just kind of help resolve all the tannins. But um, yeah, the concrete tank addition here has been a, a game changer. And then just the last year or two, I've started fermenting Malbec in the tanks, and same results. More like violet uh, and floral notes. Uh, loads of cherry, and it's just really made a, a tremendous impact on the um, structure of the wine. So as far as aging then, so uh, the website says 20 months in a custom blend of French oak barrels. So from eight different coopers, it says. So who selects these barrels and, and the combination that works? Is that you? You get to do that? that that's, that's me. So how do you do that? It sounds like a pretty arduous task. Trial and error. Yeah, I've been here for the better part of a decade. So 
the last couple of years have really been focusing on the details of like which coopers and forest selections and toast levels work best with certain parts of the vineyard. You know, getting barrels that were steam bent versus fire bent. You know, because the cab on the west end of our property, you know, it's got more of the bright red uh, fruit aromatics, and I want to be respectful of those. So I go with a lighter toast and, and a steamed bent barrel. Uh, whereas, you know, the cab on the east end of the property, it's younger, also west facing, so, and very rocky soil. So it, it gets these super dark blackberry, boysenberry, blueberry aromatics, massively structured. So it can handle um, higher toast. Also, fire bent really, really works well on that end of the vineyard. So. Yeah, just lots of tasting, trying things out, and writing notes, and trying to tweak things a little bit every year. I know we're going back a second, but just thinking about what you were saying, you sh- you you show up kind of this overwhelmed, you know, young winemaker who gets this job and it's like crazy for six months, and now you're selecting a custom. French oak barrel from eight different coopers. I mean, it's just a pretty amazing thing, right? Yeah, uh, it, you know, when I first started here, like I said, I was I was so nervous coming into work every day, uh, you know, unsure of what I had gotten myself into. And I mean, even after six months, it was I was feeling a little bit more comfortable, but still, you know, I was worried I was making the wrong decisions. But over over time, and things have gotten a little less stressful, a little easier experience especially with this property and this winery so you know like anything it just gets easier the more you do it so let's talk about some of the wines then so let's go back to the petite syrah because that was uh the the wine you said that the you know the original owner was that the reason he built the winery was to introduce everyone to that wine so talk about the petite syrah a little bit that you guys make yeah so petite is our flagship you know, it's synonymous with, with Quixote. Prior to coming here, I'd never really drank Petite Syrah, never worked with Petite Syrah. So getting to know this grape has been kind of fun. Um, you know, it can be very massive from a tannin perspective and, and brooding and dense. It, you know, like we do three different tiers of, of wines here and it's all estates. So the three Petite Syrahs are all uniquely different. So working with it and trying to coax out these differences. It's been a lot of fun. You know, like our Quixote Petite Syrah, it's aged about 18 to 20 months and 40% new French oak. It's got these just fine grains, well-layered tannins, uh, loads of density, lots of blue and black fruits, roasted meat, uh, tobacco uh, on the aromatics and flavor profile. And they age so well um, and they change. They evolve incredibly. Uh, you know, the older they get, you know, it still has those fruit components, but they start to move towards the back seat and more of the savory components come, come to the forefront so what's it like to work with, though? Is it uh, a tough wine to make or, or not? It, uh, in some ways, I feel like Petite Syrah kind of makes itself, and you've got to really work to, to screw it up. But, you know, it, if you can over-extract for sure, it's, I think the challenge is not over-extracting the tannins, doing extended macerations, giving things time to kind of resolve and soften out before going to barrel, playing with larger format barrels, for aging the petite Syrah, so you retain more of the fruit freshness and and aren't adding too many tannins via new wood. So it, uh, it it's got a lot of complexity. I feel like with uh, petite Syrah, it's just um, playing around with it and trying to coax everything out of it. It's been a lot of fun, uh, but tannin management is probably the most challenging bit uh, initially. So now you guys also make a Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, Stag's Leap District Cabernet Sauvignon. So what's that wine all about? For me, I feel like it's it's my kind of expression of this property. We're, we're at kind of the northern end of the Stag's Leap District uh, with these uh, right next to the Palisades. And then we've got this nice knoll to the west end of the property. So we get this kind of wind tunnel effect back here. 
which allows the fruit to really cool down and hold on to a lot of acidity. So I feel like our cabs here, they've got this this nice acid that brings a lot of freshness to the wines. You know, and then when you blend like the cab from the west end with the uh, cab from the east end of the property, you're getting red fruit components with this nice like darker fruit component blueberry blackberry pie and then still getting this acidic lift so i just feel like these wines are have a lot of aging potential good young but you know just get better uh with time in the cellar so i want to talk about the malbec now so um you were most gracious and sent me some of that and i told you this already but that has got to be my favorite Malbec that I've ever had. And so, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I really, I'm, I even have it written down on my notes because I wanted to ask you about it. So tell me about that. What makes it so special? I, you know, I think that's just a testament to the site more than anything else. And, and also our vineyard manager, Mike Wolf, you know, he's been farming for like 30 years. He's been farming for Kiote for about 12 years. Yeah. He's just a solid farmer. So, you know, I think he's just able to, to grow such awesome fruit. I was going to say, you don't take any credit for it, huh? <laughs> uh, maybe a, a tiny bit. Okay. Tiny bit. Yeah, the Malbec is definitely a crowd favorite around here. Uh, so I, Carl got the inspiration uh, to plant Malbec after a trip to Argentina. So that was actually planted in 2008. Uh, so it's it's relatively young compared to everything else here. Like I, I started right at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. So 2012 was kind of the, the second uh, year that fruit came off it, and you know it's it was good, but definitely you know young vines and and kind of uh, aggressive and edgy. So watching it come to its in, into its own over the last few years uh, has been a lot of fun. Uh, and it just seems like the quality here just keeps getting better and better. One cool thing about our Malbec uh, that I th- I sent you in 2019. I'm not sure what year it is. Actually, it's on the wall back there. I have to check it out. So uh, I think it was a 2019. So that uh, that was 16.2 percent alcohol. It doesn't even taste. Yeah, I like it. It doesn't. Again, just a testament to to the site and the, and the quality of the fruit. I mean, it's just so flavor packed, and if you give it uh, enough time through extended maceration, it really allows things to uh, homogenize, come together, and just um, you know be so in balance that you can't even tell that it's sixteen percent alcohol. I didn't know that. I even even drink, drinking it, I didn't know that. So I'm gonna have to check the bottle, make sure. But yeah, um, it was awesome, and I had some friends over, and they were impressed too they're thinking wow this is a good this is a awesome wine so thank you for that that that's awesome anybody who's listening who hasn't had it buy it It is excellent so i really recommend it you know it's like 0.9 acres we we get 150 cases maybe 175 on a on a, on a big year so uh, it it sells out fast oh i'm lucky i got some then i guess um, all right, so I want to talk to you about something else. So on the on the website, there is a – it's almost like a special kind of wine. It's called the Helmet of Mambrino Wines. What's that all about? I, I couldn't quite tell what that was all about, but it looked really interesting. The the Helmet of Mambrino, uh, it, it's basically our reserve tier uh, of wines. It's 100 – we make about 100 cases of, of Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Syrah under that level. Uh, but the Helmet of Mambrino, it's a very obscure reference to the story of Don Quixote. So it was basically – a barber's wash basin because uh, Don Quixote, you know, fabricated his own armor uh, out of odds and ends uh, that he could get his hands on. And one thing was this barber's wash basin, which he uh, used as his helmet when uh, he would go off on his adventures. It's just kind of a tip of the hat uh, towards the story. But the Petit Sirot, it comes from our smallest block uh, on the property. It's like three quarters of an acre. We get two and a half, maybe three tons off that block, uh, just because Petit Sirot likes to hang a little bit heavier than than other varietals here. So, and that different soil profile, it's much finer grained, uh, well drained. So, uh, I feel like the Petit Sirot from that block is just uber concentrated, 
layered, um, super dense. And that's the one that we ferment in concrete. We don't add yeast and we just kind of let it take off when it takes off and, and just um, uh, usher it along. And then the Cabernet, uh, it's basically the best of, uh, of the best. It's, it's primarily from a small section of cab on the west end of the property. Then I'll blend in small components of Cabernet from Block 9, which is on the eastern end of the property. Uh, it's also a younger, younger block that was planted in 2012. So do you guys find your do you guys sell out a wine a lot over there? Yeah, like the helmet of Mambrinos, those those have been selling out. Um, but also, you know, they're they're small production. Uh Petit is, you know, so it's it's a little bit more of a hand sell. Um, but you know, we're definitely moving through uh moving through the cases. I mean, a lot of people are attracted to that these days, the smaller production type stuff. So it doesn't surprise me that that you guys Sell a lot of that stuff. I mean, it's great, by the way, too. I mean, that helps too. That it's good wine, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is fun to see people that that come in that don't drink uh, petite sirah. You know, they're they're or cab lovers. They pour them a glass of petite sirah. They 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 swirl it. They smell it. And that first sip, they're like, "Wow, this is this is really good." Um, and then wind up buying more petite sirah than cab. So. <laughs> They probably have a ton of cab at home, so they got to get a bunch of petite sirah to go with it. Yeah. Well, the petite sirah is fun because it's just such a great food wine. Um, you know, you you can pair it with with so many different things. I mean, it does really well with lamb. One of my favorites is uh, braised short ribs, um, but it's just it's pretty versatile. Plus, with uh, the aging potential on these things, like the older it gets, the better it gets. I, I feel like. Petite Syrah, like if it made financial sense, we wouldn't release any of the Petite Syrah until it was at least eight years old. Um, but, you know, that's kind of hard to, to pencil out. So I've got just a few more questions. So I've got five just regular wine. Some of them are, most of them are wine questions. Just to get uh, five quick questions with some answers. So where does Robert Smith go wine tasting? Uh, Robert Smith doesn't go wine tasting. Oh, you don't? <laughs> no, I, I, I can't might, believe that. I might, I might, no, I, like, I, I'll go wine tasting if I have friends or family that are visiting, you know, I'll might line up one or two, uh, tastings, but I might call up a, a winemaker friend and go taste at their place uh, to bounce ideas off, get them to try one of the wines I'm working on. Outside of that, like I, I might go to like Compline or Cadet or or La Taberna uh, and order a bottle of, of you know Mencia or you know something from Rioja or somewhere other than California. <laughs> so the next question I have for you is: If you weren't making wine, what would you be doing with yourself right now? Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy cooking always have. So, uh, I, I think maybe I would have tried my hand at uh, culinary school had I not got making. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that sulfur and wine gives people headaches? I think it can I think, you know, some people are more sensitive to it than others. Some, some people are allergic to it and have a histamine reaction. So it's not a myth then is what you're saying. I don't think it's a myth. I, I think, you know, there's definitely people that are sensitive to it, and it can definitely give them a headache. So what variety of wine have you never made that you'd love to make one day? Uh, Tempranillo. And why is that? Uh, I Well, for me, I and speaking to, like, this site uh, at Quixote, I feel like it would just work really well here. I can ever convince the owners to uh, replant uh, anything. Uh, I'm I'm hoping I can get them to put in at least an acre. I, I just feel like the the conditions are are great for it. Uh, if you look at the latitude of Napa Valley, it's it's closer to southern Spain than it is to to Bordeaux. That'd be awesome. So uh, you know. Do you have enough pull with the owners to get that done, or or uh, or not? It, it's uh, maybe one of these. Uh, I've been chipping away at it for. It's not a definite no, so that's not, good. It's not a no. Uh, it's not a yes either. Uh, you know, it's something I'm still chipping away at. So 
So uh, the last question I have is, in your opinion, because you're a winemaker, so you know these things, um, does the quality of the wine glass make a difference in how we experience the wines? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely think glass definitely makes a difference. The shape, for sure, for certain varietals, you know, just really enhances uh, the aromatics. For us, wine glass is, is not just a glass, it's a tool. So, and, and you want, you know, the best tools that you can use. So does a more expensive wine glass, is it better for the wine than like a cheap wine glass, in your opinion, or does that matter at all? Uh, I feel like from, you know, uh, a blending and like winemaking standpoint, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, obviously we want the, the wines to smell their best and for us to, you know, really take it all in, you know, when we're blend decisions. So I, I definitely feel like it, it makes a, a huge difference from a consumer standpoint. Yeah. You know, I, I think as people get experience with tasting wines that, you know, they'll also see the differences, uh, as they, as they kind of graduate from, uh, lesser tiers up to, to higher tiers. I really appreciate your time, Robert. It's been awesome talking to you. I hope to make it out to Quixote one day. Uh, I mean, try the wines. It looks like such a beautiful place. And, and like you said, if it's even more beautiful in person, then I would, you know, it'd be great to, Go out there and, and check out and try out try out some of those wines and get some wine. Get some Malbec if you guys have any left. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll save a couple bottles for you. Uh, okay. But you should definitely put a, you know, plan on making a trip out here. It's, it's, it's worth, worth coming out. Well, thank you so much, Robert. It's been awesome. You've been great. Thank you so much for your time. And you must feel like the luckiest guy in the world. I mean, if I was working Napa Valley making wine, I mean, I can't think of anything better. I count my blessings every day very fortunate and thankful to be surrounded by great mentors who, you know, helped me, you know, get my start here. So ha happy, uh, you know, I get to call this my life. Well, thank you for making the, the great wines too. I mean, everybody who drinks your wines, you know, they appreciate all your hard work and everything. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Robert. Thanks, Wesley. Appreciate it. I want to thank Robert Smith and Quixote Winery for the great interview this week. I especially love his journey from winemaking intern all the way to Napa Valley winemaker. Thank you so much for listening to this first season of the Obsessed with Wine podcast. I've had some amazing guests and learned a lot about wine and winemaking. I look forward to season two of this podcast beginning in December once harvest is over. I will see you next season for more episodes of the Obsessed with Wine podcast. Until then, cheers! Cheers!